Now, what about the stroke volume? We said that the cardiac output was heart rate and stroke volume. When we talk about stroke volume, stroke volume is actually how much blood does my heart actually squeeze out each time it contracts. And we already know from previous discussion that a normal stroke volume is somewhere between 60 and 135 cc's for a quote unquote average sized person. But just like that's not specific uh, based on body surface area, just like cardiac output isn't, stroke volume also is saying it's somewhere between 60 and 135 cc's. Well, that's a big window, and that can mean completely different things for our 5 foot 220 pound patient compared to our 6 foot 2, 280 pound patient. So just like we index the cardiac output, just like we take cardiac output and we put it into a formula based on body surface area. We usually do the same thing with the, with, the, with the stroke volume and we call that the stroke index. So when we talk about the normal stroke index, a normal stroke index is 25 to 45 milliliters per meter squared. So again, all we've done with the stroke index is we've taken the stroke volume and we've put it into a formula based on the patient's body surface area to make it more specific for that patient. Now when we talk about stroke volume, remember that stroke volume is broken into three things. We have preload, afterload, and contractility. So let's look at each one of those things. When we talk about preload, remember preload is the amount of pressure in the ventricle right before the next contraction. So as blood is passively moving into my ventricle and then my atria contracts and tops off my ventricle, however much blood is in that ventricle right before it starts its next squeeze, that's what my preload is. And when we talk about preload, the way that we measure preload with hemodynamics is with pressure. And we have two different preloads. The big thing to remember is you have preload for the right side of your heart and you have preload for the left side of your heart. When we talk about the preload for our right side of our heart, we measure that with the right atrial or the central venous pressure. That's the whole reason why we would transduce somebody's central line. We want to know what the preload is for the right side of the heart. And obviously, if our CVP is low, that means there's not enough preload and we need to give the patient more preload. If the CVP is high, we may have an excessive amount of preload. Now, in contrast, when we want to look at the left side of the heart, that's actually where we stick a swan in. And when we put in the swan and we inflate the little balloon and we isolate the right side of the heart from the left side of the heart, we actually get a, an indirect measurement of what preload is for the left side of the heart. So again, the reason why we measure the wedge, the reason why we measure the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure is to get a reflection of what the preload is for the left side of the heart. And if you think about that, that makes sense. If I take a swan and I advance it into your pulmonary artery and I blow up the balloon, when I blow up the balloon, remember that the actual, the actual hole where we're monitoring pressure through is on the far side of the balloon. So it's on the left heart side of the balloon. So when I've inflated that balloon, I've essentially separated that blood vessel into what's behind the balloon and what's in front of the balloon. And if we follow what's in front of the balloon, it's one continuous vo volume of fluid that goes all the way from the pulmonary arteries to the pulmonary capillaries, through the pulmonary veins, up into the left atrium and down to the left ventricle. And assuming that the valve on the, on the left side, assuming the mitral valve is competent and it's sitting open, when my ventricle is at rest, the amount of pressure in my right vent, or excuse me, in my left ventricle is going to be the same as what the pressure is uh, at the tip of my catheter because it's all one continuous column of fluid. There's nothing there that separates it when the mitral valve is open. So we can say that the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is an indirect measurement of the left ventricular and diastolic pressure and we know that the left ventricular and diastolic pressure is the measure that we use to measure preload for the left side of the heart. Now, when we talk about the things that are going to decrease the preload, obviously it's things like hypovolemia and vasodilation. When we talk about things that are going to increase preload, it's obviously going to be things like hypervolemia, CHF, or renal failure. Now, when we talk about meds that are going to increase our preload, what types of things could we give to improve our preload? Well, we basically know that that boils down to two things. The first thing that we could do is we could give the patient vasoconstrictors. If we give the patient a vasoconstrictor, we vasoconstrict everything down. We make the, the whole vascular space smaller, so the amount of fluid that's in there is going to be under higher pressure. The second way that we increase preload, really the main way that we increase preload, obviously, is by giving the patient more fluid. If their preload is low because their vaso, or if their preload is low because they're fluid depleted, then obviously we're going to give them fluid. By giving them fluid, we increase their preload.
Now, what are some medications that are going to decrease the preload? Well, when we talk about meds that are going to decrease the preload, we have several options. One good example would be something like an ACE inhibitor. When I give somebody an ACE inhibitor, I prevent angiotensin 1 from becoming angiotensin 2, and that causes blood vessels to vasodilate a bit. So we get a bigger com container for the same amount of fluid. When we talk about alpha blockers, alpha blockers can also decrease our preload. They have a lot bigger effect, though, on decreasing our afterload, but they do have some effect on our preload as well. We can also give patients drugs like nitro or nipride to decrease their preload. Remember that nitro and nipride are kind of like ideal agents for decreasing the preload because they at lower doses, or excuse me, uh, at nitro specifically at lower doses, has dramatic effects on vasodilation. So when we put somebody on nitro uh, at our lower doses, that vasodilation is predominantly venous. So by vasodilating the venous side, we really increase the amount of, of space that's available available for blood to just kind of sit. Now when we talk about nipride, nipride is predominantly arterial just like nitro is at higher doses like more than 80 mics a minute. And those drugs again were on, on a high dose nitro or on nipride were predominantly going to increase afterload but we also get some amount of preload reduction as well. Another drug we use often to decrease preload would be something like morphine. Remember that morphine causes a histamine response. And when we uh, have an increase in histamine release, that causes us to vasodilate. And when we talk about uh, our diuretics, remember that our diuretics also are going to, to uh, decrease preload in two ways. Specifically, when we look at diuretics like Lasix, remember that Lasix in and of itself causes venodilation. So it can cause a significant increase in the capacitance of the venous system, but it also causes diuresis. And obviously, if we're diuresing, we're losing fluid, which is also going to decrease our preload. Now what about afterload? Remember afterload is the resistance that the heart has to pump against to get blood out. So we can almost think of preload as being like the venous side of things, afterload as being like the arterial side of things. Now remember that the higher your afterload is, the more work it's going to be for the heart to get blood out. And so while our first kind of gut response anytime we get hypotensive is to vasoconstrict down, while that may help our blood pressure, that may actually hurt cardiac output. When we talk about afterload, remember that afterload isn't something that we directly, ma uh, directly measure like preload. When I want to know what the preload for the right side of the heart is, I stick in a central line and I see what the CVP is. I'm monitoring it directly. When I want to know what the preload is for the left side of the heart, I stick in a swan and I monitor the wedge. I'm actually directly monitoring how much pressure is, is in, the, is in the, uh, the, the pulmonary system and indirectly how much pressure is in the left ventricle. In contrast, when we're measuring afterload, we do that based on mathematical calculations that take into account the cardiac output and the patient's mean arterial pressure and things like that. When we talk about afterload, we have an afterload for the right side of the heart and we have an afterload for the left side of the heart. So just like we have a preload for the right side and a preload for the left side, we also have an afterload for the right side and an afterload for the left side. When we talk about the afterload for the right side, remember that for the right side to do its job, its whole function in life, the reason why you have a right heart is to prime the left heart. Well, what has it got to do to do that? Well, it's got to push blood through our whole pulmonary system first. So when we're talking about the afterload for the right ventricle, we call that pulmonary vascular resistance. And pulmonary vascular resistance, we said, is basically how tight are all the blood vessels in the lungs. Now, whenever we're monitoring vascular resistance or whenever we're calculating vascular resistance, the unit of measurement that we actually use is a dyne, and a dyne is basically a measurement of resistance. And so when we talk about normal pulmonary vascular resistance, a normal pulmonary vascular resistance for an adult is usually somewhere around 50 to 250 dynes. Now, if the patient becomes vasodilated in their pulmonary arteries and in their pulmonary veins, we would see a decrease in their PVR. So that means that the peripheral vascular resistance would be a smaller number. So somebody who has a really low pulmonary vascular resistance, they may only have a PVR of, say, uh, 30 or 40. In contrast, when we get vasoconstriction there, remember we said the number one reason why that would happen would be hypoxia. If we get vasoconstriction there, then obviously that number gets high. So we may have a pulmonary vascular resistance of say 500 dynes, meaning that the patient is really vasoconstricted in their lungs. Now, 
Just like we have an afterload for the right side of the heart, we said we have afterload for the left side of the heart, and that's the systemic vascular resistance. And the systemic vascular resistance is also measured in dynes. And when we talk about a normal SVR, a normal SVR is somewhere around 800 to 1,200 dynes. Now, these are also two numbers that you need to know. You need to know what a normal PBR is and you need to know what a normal SBR is because when they give you scenarios on your exam where they want you to manage the hemodynamics, they're typically not going to give you a normal set of values. They're just going to give you what the patient's values are. So you certainly need to know what a normal cardiac output is. You need to know what a normal cardiac index is. Uh, you need to know what a normal CVP is, what a normal wedge is, you need to know what a normal PVR is, and you also need to know what a normal SVR is. So again, a normal pulmonary vascular resistance somewhere around 50 to 250 dynes, a normal systemic vascular resistance somewhere around 800 to 1200 dynes. Now when we talk about things that are going to increase the pulmonary vascular resistance, we've already hit on that repeatedly, but the number one thing is hypoxia. And the second thing that would cause an increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance is going to be uh, any backup of fluid. So for example, if we've got uh, a, a, left, a left ventricle problem, if we're, if we're backing up uh, fluid into our left ventricle, or if our, I'm sorry, if our left ventricle is failing and fluid is backing up, well, as that starts to move into the lungs and it starts the third space, that third spacing causes separation of the alveoli from the capillaries, we get more hypoxic, and again, we get an increase in our pulmonary vascular resistance. Uh, when we talk about things that are going to decrease our pulmonary vascular resistance, obviously good oxygenation is going to decrease our pulmonary vascular resistance. But the other thing is most of the drugs that decrease our SVR are also going to decrease our, our PVR. So a good example would be something like dobutamine. When I put somebody on dobutamine, that typically causes a decrease in the SVR, also typically causes a decrease in the PVR. Now let's look at the SVR side of things, the systemic vascular resistance or what the left ventricle has to push against to overcome its afterload. When we talk about SVR, remember that SVR is going to be decreased by several things. The, the, probably the best example of things that are going to decrease the SVR are any of your distributive shock kinds of problems. So people who are in sepsis, uh, when they're in sepsis they have a massive uh, vasodilation. When patients are in uh, uh, things like anaphylaxis, that histamine causes massive vasodilation. When people have neurogenic shock because they've had a transection of their cord, all that stuff is going to decrease my SVR. Other things that would decrease my SVR would be things like uh, uh, our vasodilators. Uh, and uh, finally, when we talk about things that are going to increase our afterload or increase our SVR, we're talking about things like hypertension, uh, renal artery stenosis, aortic stenosis, intra uh, or excuse me, idiopathic hypertrophic subaortic stenosis, anything that's going to cause massive vasoconstriction or anything that's going to make it harder to get blood out of the left ventricle, like say aortic insufficiency or, or, or aortic regurgitation, all those things are going to increase my afterload. It's going to make it harder to get blood out. Okay, now when we talk about things that are going to increase the SBR, basically this is all of our pressor drugs. So when we put somebody on high doses of dopamine, when we put somebody on levo, uh, or we put them on neosinephrine or epinephrine, all of those drugs are going to increase our systemic vascular resistance. When we talk about things that are going to decrease our systemic vascular resistance, classic examples are things like uh, nitroprusside, uh, or nipride, uh, hydros nitro causes a decrease in the SVR, uh, corlipam is a drug that we use that's a dopaminergic drug that decreases SVR, uh, calcium channel blockers like cardine are going to decrease our SVR, ACE inhibitors have dramatic effects on our SVR, alpha blockers obviously are going to do it, uh, dobutamine is going to do it, and Natricor is going to do it. So those are all the big drugs we can use to actually decrease the systemic vascular resistance. Okay, the final component of, of, of actual cardiac output or, or specifically stroke volume, remember we said stroke volume was made of three things, preload, afterload, and contractility. The final component is contractility, and remember contractility is how well can the heart in and of itself squeeze and push blood out. And remember contractility is basically dependent on two things. There's two things we have to have to have good contractility. The first thing that we have to have is we have to have healthy muscle that's getting plenty of oxygen in the form of plenty of oxygenated blood. If we have good coronary circulation with well oxygenated blood, then we're well on our way to having good contractility.
The second big thing that we have to have is we have to have a perfect balance of our electrolytes. We have to have plenty of calcium where it's supposed to be. We have to have plenty of sodium and potassium, and they both need to be distributed where they're supposed to be. And if we have that, then we're well on our way to having good contractility. Now, when we talk about things that are going to decrease contractility, we actually know that some examples of things that are going to decrease contractility would be things like electrolyte imbalances, cardiac ischemia because of hypoxia, and uh, acidosis. Acidosis in and of itself causes a decrease in contractility. And the other thing that we now know causes a decrease in contractility is actually something called myocardial suppressant factor. And myocardial suppressant factor can be released with various types of inflammation. And so for patients in sepsis, we can actually see a decrease in their contractility eventually just because of this myocardial suppressant factor. When we talk about things that are going to increase contractility, basically what we break it down into is things like uh, high levels of calcium, increases in sympathetic nervous system stimulation, and then obviously drugs like digoxin or dobutamine or things like that, inotropic, chronotropic type drugs. Okay, this seems like a pretty good place for a break. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll continue on with our discussion of hemodynamics. In the interim, I hope that you have a great day, and I'll see you soon. My life